Okay, good morning, everyone. I will just turn on my camera so you can see me, hopefully. Okay, good morning, all. It's 10 o'clock, so we will make a start. I guess there'll be a few people that will join the meeting as we as we go along, but um, we'll just try and keep things on track anyway. So, my name is Ian Marnane, and I work with the Environmental Protection Agency in um, chemicals and ecosystems monitoring team. So uh, today we'll be talking about the National Ecosystems Monitoring Network that we are charged with establishing. So I'll just give a quick introduction now, um, give a little bit of uh, talk about the logistics of the meeting today, and uh, then I'll hand over to some other presenters who will bring you through some of the, the main content. So just to give a bit of background, so as I said, the EPA are responsible for development of this National Ecosystems Monitoring Network, which is a requirement under the National Emissions Ceiling Directive. And really, I suppose the key element of this is to identify, is to set up a network of ecosystems monitoring sites that we can use to uh, assess the impact of air pollution on, on various habitats, and in particular, sensitive habitats. So that's really, I suppose, at the core of what we want to get out of, of this network as we set it up over the next few years. Um, currently, so what, we just, what we're doing this year and what the objective of today is, is that uh, we wanted to identify what the potential sites should be that would be part of that network with a review to reporting those sites at the next uh, reporting round in 2022. So we would report sites then and then report, start reporting data in the, in the following year. So really this study, we got uh, UCD and the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology on board to support us in this work and to come up with some initial recommendations around what a national ecosystems monitoring network might look like. So that's what we're going to present to you today. It's not, it's not a fait accompli by any means, and really what we're presenting is the initial findings. And then obviously we need to go into the implementation stage. So we're really at the very early stages in terms of, of developing this network. The other thing is obviously we need, we're looking, we need to make sure we have the res right resources in place from an EPA point of view in terms of the initial development and the implementation of the, of the network as well. So um, today we'll present those study findings and look for your feedback. In terms of what we want from you today, um, so you've been identified as some of the key stakeholders in relation to this uh, in relation to this network. So really, what we're keen to find out is who has an interest in what we're doing, um, and who has any inputs and any feedback in relation to what we're proposing to do in relation to the establishment of the network. We're looking for opportunities for collaboration. So in terms of, for example, developing or operating or data sharing. Um, as part of the development of this network, because we're very aware that there's a lot of other activities going on in in uh, in academia and in other state agencies as well. So as to see where there might be overlaps or potential synergies or opportunities, for example, to co-locate equipment and develop a uh, better and more comprehensive data set around some of these uh, habitats. We also, in general, I suppose, are looking for your feedback. Is there anything that we've missed or anybody that we should be talking to that's that, that's not involved in, in the process to date? Um, we will, we'll also be looking to set up an external steering group for the network. So again, we'll be looking for people to get involved in that because obviously it's a very much uh, of interest to a number of different stakeholders. So we want to make sure we have the right people involved. So that's what we'll go through today. In terms of logistics, um, so what we're going to do is go through all of the presentations first. So we'll have a number of presentations from colleagues in UCD and from CEH, and I'll show you the agenda in a moment. Um, and we'd ask you to place your questions. So hopefully on your menu there, you can see an option to add in questions. So you can put in questions in text. Uh, this plat platform that we're using today is GoToWebinar. And the way it's set up at the moment is that um, questions are ans ans entered in as a text. But if you, uh, if we can engage people as panelists, so we can we can uh, allocate people to be a panelist, and then they will be able to speak 
So if you prefer, for example, to verbally ask your question or if you want to get involved in a discussion or um, you just feel like a chat, just uh, put, a, put that in the questions box and just ask for the floor. And we can uh, we can give you we can make sure that you have a chance to speak. Now we are limited in the number of people that can be that can speak, so we need to use that a little bit judiciously. But we'll work within the the, uh, the system, and we do want to make sure that everybody has a chance to speak. Obviously, we would prefer to be in a room together doing this, and hopefully, we'll be able to do that next year, or at least stand on a bog or do something um, where we'll be. To some extent, face to face, but this is the the next best thing for the moment. So we appreciate your engagement and your patience, and there will be opportunities to engage on this on an ongoing basis. Um, so just to go through, just to to briefly, if I can get my slides working here, just to briefly list the the contributors to the work so far from UCD and UKCEH, and also to acknowledge the the input that we've and the support that we've got from Deirdre Lynn and Andy Bleasdell in uh, MPWS as well, who have been uh, significant contributors to the to the work to date and have been very helpful. So uh, just to acknowledge that. And here's the agenda. So we're already a minute or two behind, but um, so we'll have uh, we'll kick off with. Dahi in, in a couple of moments uh, from UCD and then Thomas Cummins. And then we have our colleagues from UKCEH, which will we'll go through a number of presentations in relation to the process of identifying the, the sites, um, what would be intended to do in terms of the biodiversity and soil monitoring, and then the air quality and deposition monitoring activities. Then we'll go into the Q&A. But as we go along, if you could please add in your questions as we're going through the presentations. And then, as I said, we'll deal with them all at the end. Also to mention again, if you do want to talk, just let us know. Just ask for the floor in that questions box and we'll give you an opportunity to do that. So hopefully everybody has been able to hear me and see me OK. Um, and I haven't been just talking to my screen for the last five minutes. Um, but now I will ask Phil, who's who's uh, helping us out on the logistics to uh, hand things over to Dahi for his presentation. Thanks. Okay, Dahi. Morning, everyone. Can uh, you ask Ian, can you see my screen? I can and I can hear you. Perfect. Right, perfect. I'll make a start. So, um, Ian did a great job introducing the network. And I think I just want to point out one thing. I'm not sure if Ian mentioned, but the, the, the webinar today is being recorded. Um, so it'll be available online for anybody that may have missed it um, earlier. Um, so I'm just going to go into a little bit more in depth than Ian did in the in introducing the network and the give an overview of some of the proposed updates that um, myself and my colleagues in UKCH and the UCD have um, proposed. Um, and this is just you know an example slide of some of the uh, nice scenery in Ireland, some monitoring and some impacts from air pollution. So as Ian pointed out, this is pretty much a result of the, um, the National Emission Ceilings Directive, why we're sitting here, all sitting here today. Um, now, this is previously focused on emissions rather than looking at concentrations, impacts and deposition, um, specifically for sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, ammonia and uh, NMVOCs, so non-methane volatile organic compounds, which just point out that that's a precursor for ground level ozone, which is another um, potential consideration for the network. Not a huge consideration due to the lack of impacts in Ireland, but it, it's still a um, in the template for reporting. So on the left here, I've just you know example map of these are ammonia concentrations across Europe, and then on the bottom right, these are the actual the the network as was submitted in 2018. But it's not the entire network; it's only the sites that reported ammonia concentration and deposition monitoring, because there should be four extra sites on Ireland. Um, so as I said, the focus had previously been on emissions, but due to recognition that um, these pollutants cause actual harm on the environment um, that may not have been represented in national invent emissions inventory reporting. So the, the, the requirements of the directive, shit, directive, they still require the emissions inventory reporting, but now they've shifted to include um, impacts on ecosystems, which is hugely important. Um, so as I mentioned previously, this is there, there's a focus on the concentration, deposition, and impacts now in addition to emissions, um, because it's all connected. So high emissions um, is going to lead to high. If you've got high um, emissions either nationally or locally, you're going to have high 
deposition concentrations and subsequently impacts. Um, so on a national stage, um, SO2, NOx and NMVOC are below their current emission limits set by the National Emission Ceiling Directive and they're decreasing, whereas ammonia, um, NH3, is above the limit and is actually continually increasing. So much more of a, um, a dire, dire circumstances around ammonia. And on the right here, we have, these are from the Chagisk um, MAC curve, which is about ammonia abatement. So on the top, we can see these are the predicted emissions going into 2030. Um, without any mitigation, and you see under no circ under no scenario, so these are three different scenarios of production intensity, under no scenario do we actually meet our emission limit without additional mitigation. So even when full mitigation is implemented, um, only, under, on, only under two scenarios do we actually meet our targets. So the two targets are the yellow dots, and the lines are the predicted emissions. Um, so one way or another, it's going to be very difficult for us to meet our ammonia emission ceilings, but also it's going to be quite difficult for us to meet our N NOx and NMVC ceilings for 2030, because again, the, um, the limits keep decreasing. So the contribution of ammonia and NOx in com combination, are they, they act as contributing towards total nitrogen deposition, which is a significant driver for ecological impacts, both nationally and internationally. It's a huge problem. And it's a priority consideration for Ireland's um, national e ecosystem monitoring network. So introducing the broad term network, it's, as we said, National Ecosystem Monitoring, um, intended to set up long-term permanent sites, very important, to monitor the impacts of air pollution on sensitive sites and concentration and deposition of these pollutants. So the guidance recommends the network be representative, cost-effective, and risk-based. It's going to be an iterative network with a four-year reporting cycle, and it's intended to improve from year to year, from cycle to cycle. So every four years, it should be ideally a better network than it was in the previous four years. And that's the current plan um, going forward, obviously. And on the right here, this is just a photograph of, imp of impact of air pollution. So on the top, we've got sphagnum moss, which has been, has been impacted, presumably by ammonia, or nitrogen deposition. And on the bottom, it's, it's a healthier example of some um, sphagnum moss. So the first sites that were selected, you know, you have to encourage cost effectiveness. We, it's recommended we utilize existing networks. So these have, are sites which may have already have data collected, um, may already have funding to be carried out. And the monitoring for the first submission prioritized International Cooperative Program on Assessment and Monitoring Air Pollution Effects on Forests and Freshwaters. So, so ICP Forests and ICP Waters. We also included two new um, sites, a bog and a grassland. So on the right, we, on, the right on the top, we have the, um, the bog that was proposed as Clara Bog, and on the bottom, that's Ballymacue Grassland in the Midlands. There was no data available for these submissions, but they were included as proposed sites to, to, um, for the next stage of the development, so with the intention of eventually including monitoring on these sites. So we've already submitted data for this directive. The first submission was in June 2019, so the last year. Um, lots of data for ICP forests all the way back to 1987. So the first submission required us to submit any historical data that was available for the sites that were selected. So we had quite a lot of data for two ICP forest sites um, in Mayo and in Wicklow. And we also had quite a lot of data for four ICP water sites maintained by the EPA. Um, so these, this went back for, from 1990 to 2018 and it's continue, continually ongoing. There was no data at the time available for the bog site, the grassland site. So that's Clare Bog and Ballymacue. Or there's also 35 ICP forest level one sites. Now, what a level one site is, I'll come into now in a second. So the feedback from the commission for the, for this for the, the entirety of all submissions from across Europe, with a specific focus on Ireland, we were recommended that we need to include more terrestrial ecosystems, specifically moors and bogs, and semi-natural grasslands, and also more monitoring on the sites which were selected. So. Not only do we need more sites, we also need to conduct more monitoring on those sites. So the report, the subsequent report in 2019, again reiterated, look, we need more heatlands, bogs, acid sensitive grasslands. And that's across Europe. So those habitats are, are typically underrepresented in the European network, not just in Ireland. So the structure of the proposed network, I mean, we're leaning very heavily on the approach adopted by ICP Forests, which was, you've got two different categories of sites selected. So we've got level two sites, which are instrumented. So there, um, they have instruments collecting data regularly, bi-monthly, monthly, however, they're collect they have instruments collecting data. Level one sites, however, are non-invasive. So they don't have any instrumentation on site. So what we've proposed is kind of a, an adapted um, structure for this network where we've got level two core, 
where we're doing detailed air quality monitoring using instruments. Level two, where we're just focusing on ammonia monitoring. Now, the reason we're doing that is because we want to have slightly more sites covering ammonia because it's such a highly spatially variable, variable pollutant um, that you, just by just having the level two core sites, it's kind of underrepresenting the potential impacts of ammonia. So because Ireland doesn't have an ammonia monitoring network, this kind of fills that gap in adapting these sites to fit that need. And we also have level one biodiversity and soil monitoring, which is a much wider network of sites, which are our level one sites. Um, and on, on the right, these are the 35 ICP forest sites um, on which there's currently, there's, there has been surveys conducted since the, uh, the first submission of data. We're also proposing we integrate level zero sites, and these will be, you know, not fixed sites by any means, but where biological data quadrats are collected on any national survey could theoretically be integrated into a model in, into a database which has um, paired up with a uh, nitro, with, with nitrogen deposition or ammonia concentration modelled map for Ireland. So any biological data collected would be valuable. So this is just to highlight that fact that we also want to consider impacts on sites which aren't part of the core network and this they won't this these won't be submitted to Europe but will inf inform the, um, the the process of understanding the impacts across Ireland so we're recommending um we we feel like the, the Department of Agriculture food and marine they're, 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 they're already involved and they're already managing the level one forest surveys so, so the ICP forest monitoring um, so we have two sites currently identified for a level two core. There's no monitoring currently on these sites, so that needs to be in, reintegrated again. Level one forests, they're included. Um, the freshwater sites, they're being managed by the EPA. We do suggest adi adding um, additional level one sites for the freshwaters. I'll go into that in a second or two. Um, and also importantly, I think the terrestrial ecosystems um, would, would heavily rely on potential collaboration with National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, so that's one we want, we've proposed and identified sites to cover raised bogs, blanket bogs, wet heats, calcareous grasslands, and Malini meadows. So we can see that we've got we're proposing 60 level one sites to, to give broad representation to each of those habitats, 16 level two sites across the whole range, and 17 level two core, which is the full the um, the full proposed monitoring, um, air pollution and ecological etc. So in order so in order to make sure that but our proposed monitoring complies with the existing monitoring from both the EPA and the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine and National Parks and Wildlife Service. It would need slight modification of approaches, um, which I'm going to go into now. So ICP forests, again, as I said, level two sites need to be reestablished. They stopped monitoring in 2018 and they're relying on, fun on funding and availability and staff time from the National Ecosystem Monitoring Network to be set up again. The 35 level one sites, the monitoring is ongoing and um, what, what we do highly recommend they currently focus on crown condition this should be expanded to include moss sample and moss sample collection and soil sample collection because both are requirements under the um the template for reporting for sites and these, these are very relatively easy to collect on the ground on site so you can go out you, you have a field guide you say okay well this is the moss i need to collect you find out you put in a mug and and it's so they're simple things to be collected that become that could be done by almost anybody you don't need to be, be a professional um, biologist to figure out what moss that is, it'll be in the guide. Um, and then obviously we, we're not proposing that the partners do all the analysis of these samples collected, but that, that should be contracted out separately by the EPA. So freshwaters, we, there's four ICP water sites currently continually, continuously collecting monthly freshwater chemistry and biodiversity data. That's fantastic. We need to encourage that to continue. I'm presuming it will. Um, but what we would recommend is that they be expanded to include atmospheric monitoring. Um, so they're currently focused on the freshwater um, um, analysis, but if they incorporate the atmospheric monitoring, then it adds much significant weight to the national network that, we're, that we're, we're proposing to roll out. So this would require an increased sampling frequency. Um, same will go into that towards the end of the present presentation today, or the webinar today. Um, so what we also want to include level one sites. So we're, what we're currently proposing is we use upland lakes that are previously monitor, monitored by the University of uh, Trent in Canada. These are typically in a remote and difficult to access areas. So we're, current, we're, we're proposing you know, a limited approach where we're saying, okay, well, look, if we do chemical and biological sampling once a year on five sites a year, you could cover 
20 sites over a four-year cycle. And that, that could be a relatively straightforward thing that wouldn't require a huge amount of effort, but it would, would add significant, significant benefits to the, to the network as proposed. Terrestrial ecosystems, as I said, that will rely heavily on um, the uh, involvement and support of the National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, and it'll hopefully there'll be a two-way stream. So the Nature 2000 sites are reported under the Habitats Directive every six years, and these are, these are the supporting surveys to report the, the condition of these habitats formed, uh, typically form the Irish Wildlife Manuals, which are all available online. These are the basis, we've used these sites that were previously included in Irish Wildlife Monitoring and proposed sites for future integration into, the, into um, MPWS, bio, MPWS Biomonitoring um, as our basis for site selection for our network. So ideally it will ease the inter integration of the two uh, monitoring networks. Um, and again, Ed will go into this in more detail afterwards, but this would require that the, the site modification from National Parks and Wildlife Service approach to make sites permanent, it may require additional surveys, i.e. soil and moss collection, um, and it, it may require a change in the frequency of monitoring. So whereas the reporting required for the habitat directive is every six years, now that doesn't mean the monitoring occurs every six years, but the, if it was linked with the, any, the National Ecosystem Monitoring Network, it, it would really benefit it if monitoring, at least on the permanent sites, was conducted um, every four years. And that's my last slide. So I can, I'm very happy to introduce Thomas Cummins um, of UCD to give the next presentation on synergies. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Dahi. We have uh, identified a lot of opportunities for potential synergies, but everything that, that we're doing here come, uh, emerges from the National Mission Ceiling Directive, and our design for that uh, is driven by the directive, but there's a lot of flexibility in what's, what's possible to do. The directive, of course, is primarily concerned with emission re reductions, which codifies uh, pre-existing agreements under the Convention on Long-Range Transboundary Air Pollution, or the Air Convention. Um, it parallels the Ambient Air Quality Directive and the, the Climate Action Plan implements the actions that, that will lead to the, the reductions or hopefully the reductions in, in a lot of these emissions. Under the Air Convention, the LRTAP, the international cooperative programs that have been mentioned already provide both sites and methods which can contribute to the other action of the uh, NEC directive, which is to monitor the negative impacts on ecosystems. As well as the ICPs providing uh, sites and methods, the Water Framework Directive has existing monitoring, which provides more, and the Natura 2000 network coming from the Habitats and Birds Directive similarly provides sites. So all of these are contributing to the design, um, which, isn't very tightly specified under the NEC directive. The, the requirement is to monitor negative impacts uh, and that a, a network of, of sites be established, which, which is risk-based, representative and cost-effective, but the specific methods or selection of sites are not specified. Now, it's strongly hinted that the methods uh, of the ICP, the more than hinted, it's, 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 it's explicitly indicated without being a requirement that the methods of the ICPs should be should be used or could be used, may be used. So really there's an awful lot of um, member state uh, freedom as to, to the, the specifics of the design of the network. So the, 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 the design process is what we're describing here, ultimately leading to the, the network. But of course, any data that we produce from the network will be dependent on on these uh, decisions that we're making, well, proposals and recommendations that we're making at the moment, ultimately leading to decisions, which which of course are uh, by EPA. There's a lot, as uh, uh, Ian has has indicated, uh, of opportunities for collaboration, and a few that that we've um, discussed, but of course nothing agreed yet. But that we've discussed is possible integration with the, the, the ICOS network, um, uh, which uh, will allow 
um, co-location at, at, at one or more sites and uh, collaboration with the Chagas catchments monitoring. The Chagas catchments, of course, are in agricultural land and don't come under the, the natural, semi-natural forest or freshwater uh, ecosystem scope of the the integrate of the monitoring network, but they do allow um, monitoring of air conditions. So ammonia monitoring at the Chagas catchments is a is a is a potential for integration. The Agmet Group has a proposal for um, cosmic ray soil moisture monitoring uh, installations, with, and we have the potential maybe for one co-location with that in the case that 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 network or that infrastructure is funded. So uh, it's important to see, I suppose, EPA as the central agency here and, and under the, 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 the guidance and hopefully the, the funding of the relevant government departments. Um, NPWS are the, the, the most busy actors uh, in the reporting under the Habitats Directive. So uh, that integration is really important to the network, as is the integration of the existing activity uh, uh, managed by EPA under the Water Framework Directive. And then it's clear and it's, it's written in the, in the directive that the convention, the Air Convention, uh, ICPs, ICP waters, ICP forests, ICP vegetation, which doesn't have fixed sites but has multiple surveys, and ICP integrated monitoring for which Ireland uh, contributes one site, though it's not, a, 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 not doing the mandatory work for that. Um, that those ICPs, uh, which have very extensive uh, defined methods and also connect to very large networks across Europe, that they're, they're uh, important contributors. And um, the upland lakes, which were previously surveyed uh, and, and need a new, a new home, if you like, which were previously surveyed by, by Trent University uh, de at decadal intervals, uh, will be incorporated in or recommended to be incorporated. Now, there's a lot of other uh, agencies and networks, uh, some of which I may have listed here, and so apologies if I've left out anyone who I've, uh, who we've been talking to, or uh, included anyone we haven't been talking to. Um, the important thing I think to remember at this point is we're we're in the design and proposal and recommendation stage. The decision making is up to EPA and their steering committee or or whatever structure they establish for this. Um, nothing's agreed. At the moment, nobody's nobody's committed. So uh, there's potential, I think, for for any interested persons to uh, engage in in informal discussions and get in contact. And and now is a good time to to be active about that. It's certainly not too late to initiate that. Okay, I'm going to stop there and pass over to the next speaker. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I've got a slight complication, unfortunately, and the PowerPoint isn't working online. Let me just try it once more. Well, that's uh, slightly embarrassing. Um, the PowerPoint isn't working, I'm afraid. We, um, Lawrence, I can try and access it um, and I can possibly share it, but I'll have to download it. So give me one second. Okay. Shall we? Uh, let me see. So hold fire for the moment. Talk, talk among yourselves. And... So just while we, <clears throat> while we try and get this running, I'll just briefly explain what I'll be talking about. So I'll be running through the the site selection process that we followed um, to come up with a sort of proposed list of sites. So as uh, Dottie and Thomas said earlier, this isn't a final, you know, this isn't set in stone. This is uh, just the, the, our sort of suggestions, our recommendations for how to take this forward. Um, yep, yeah, I have it here, so yeah. I will just fill to um, share. Okay, so uh, can you see that now? 
Lars? Um, no, I can't see. Okay, hold on. Uh, okay, hold on. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, okay, yeah, that's working. Okay, so just shout when you want me to go on to the next slide. Sorry. Um, Sorry, Ian, I think that's I the, um, is it the wrong presentation, Ian? No, I think that, is it? No. Oh, no, that uh, might be that presentation. No, you're right, that's Ed's presentation. Okay, sorry, give me one moment. And we'll get the right one. It's, uh, okay. Apologies all. Save. So I've been trying to, I went back onto the shared site and it wasn't working. Okay, here we go. Wonderful. That better? Wonderful. Yeah, that's okay. great. Thank you very much. So I've given a bit of intro. Uh, let's. Um, so there's two levels of, of recording. So level one focuses on the the measurements of impact, and level two focuses on the atmospheric chemistry monitoring. So I'll briefly talk about the how we selected the habitats to start with, and then move on to how we select the level one sites impact, ecological impact at level two for atmospheric monitoring. So next slide, please. The basic principle of the reporting is to show evidence of pollution impacts. So there's a number of things that we have to uh, take into account when we're designing this kind of scheme. In order to show impact, you need to show how things differ at a highly impacted site compared to a low impacted site. So if we only selected the sites where there were lots of damage, we, we don't have a comparator for that. But the ideal approach is perhaps to take a gradient approach, and it's, this is used in a lot of studies, where you choose sites over a range of end deposition levels. So you can then see how you get sequential damage as you move further down that, that sort of to higher levels of nitrogen deposition. So that's the basic approach we've taken. The, the sort of Carly Stevens paper, which many of you are aware of in 2004, that used 60 sites for acid grassland just for one habitat. Clearly there aren't the resources in this, in this scheme to do that. So we've, we've narrowed down on a recommendation of 15 sites per habitat to give enough the, uh, enough sort of control of the variation across that gradient. The, one of the big costs of doing this kind of scheme is the actual site visits. So bearing that in mind, bearing in mind that overhead and the, the fact that we're recommending 15 sites per habitat, we suggest that these sites are visited once every four years. So these are, you know, these are slow responses relatively when we're talking about ecological impact. So it's it's sufficient to visit them once every four years. And that means that you can bring in a wider group of sites and perhaps have a rolling scheme where you visit a certain number each year. Um, so adding to the number of habitats, the first phase we're suggesting that we add another five habitat types to the you know, to the first phase of this project to do five habitats well and then see how the network runs and see whether there's scope to introduce more habitats later. Next slide. Um, so in terms of the criteria for selecting habitats, they, you know, this is following the guidance that they received from the commission. The sites need to be sensitive to air pollution, so in particular nitrogen, of course, and ammonia. And they need to be of conservation importance within Ireland. So as I, as I said earlier, we're recommending five new habitats. So these are, this is the list of habitats. So you have raised bog, blanket bog and wet heath, which we are actually in terms of the site selection to a certain extent because they have quite similar sensitivity to nitrogen and they share similar ecological processes and functions. 
Uh, we then have calcareous grassland. And the fifth suggestion is Melinia Meadows. There's a little bit of scope to revisit this, so it'd be good to get feedback on this. So perhaps, you know, we might swap out the last suggested habitat for a different one. And as uh, Dottie and Thomas have already described, there's existing networks providing the data for the forests and fresh waters. Next slide. So in terms of selecting actual sites for the network, so thinking about level one, where we're focusing on the ecological impacts, so impacts on soils and vegetation, which uh, Ed will be talking about after this. The sites need to represent that nitrogen risk gradient, so across that whole gradient. And importantly, especially with only 15 sites, we need to take account of co-correlated factors. So in Ireland, rainfall is probably the, the biggest co-correlated factor. And that's quite strongly correlated with the end deposition gradient. Uh, the reason for taking into account these, these other aspects is that you might be interpreting your results and say, yes, there's a clear evidence of nitrogen impact here. But actually, that may be, those responses may be primarily driven by rainfall. So as much as possible within the constraints of setting up this network, we've tried to take into account these correlated factors. I'll explain shortly how we've done that. So to summarize, we're going to have 15 sites per habitat balanced across these gradients. And because we only have 15 sites, we've taken a, a sort of stratified selection process. Ideally, this would be random, but with only 15, we don't have the, the opportunity to do that. So we, we have to do some sort of directed approach to, to ensure that we can cover these, these gradients. And then there's a few practical considerations as well when it comes down to final site selection, uh, such as sort of are there links to other networks, and um, you know, the inclusion of the level two sites, etc. Next slide. So I'm going to just quickly talk through a couple of examples of how we've done this. So the first example is calcareous grassland. So the sites range from around three and a half kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year up to 11 and a half. Um, I should say at the outset that these were sites selected from the NT NPWS monitoring. So we have existing data for all of these sites. And that's actually really useful when it comes to helping interpret change due to changes in nitrogen and change across that gradient. So we split the end deposition into five more or less equal bands. So we have sort of ranging from low to high. The color scheme indicates a sort of initial separation due to rainfall. So sort of separating low, medium and high rainfall sites. And we did this separately for each habitat. So high rainfall for calcareous grassland might not be the same as high rainfall for bogs, raised bogs, for example. So in order to balance out across this gradient, we're aiming to select the three sites for each of the end deposition class. Next slide. So this is the same data, um, but the color schemes are slightly different. So red, red squares are the sites that we're suggesting as uh, taken. So like I said, we're aiming for three per band, but sometimes it's not feasible to do that, but broadly we're trying to balance the selection across the gradient. So you can see how we've tried to ensure that for each rainfall band, we're sort of sampling across two or more end deposition bands. So the top green ellipse shows that we've managed to, for the high rainfall, we've managed to select sites in two rainfall bands, two end depth bands, and then for the other of their other, you know, the medium and low rainfall sites. For each of those, we managed to select sites across four of the end deposition bands. So as much as possible, this allows us to, it gives us better statistical power 
to differentiate the effects of rainfall and nitrogen when we're doing the analysis. Next slide. So again, the same principle for uh, blanket bog and wet heath. Um, so for this, you know, the, the sort of slightly lower rainfall sites, we've actually managed to select sites right across that end up gradient. So that's really good. And then we've got a, a bit of a pairing for the higher rainfall sites as well. So, um, you know, at least one site from each band and those, those two end up bands at the low end of the, the low end up end of the gradient for high rainfall. So that gives you an idea of the approach we've taken. We've done this for each of the, the habitat type with a, a sort of suggested selection. So next slide. Um, so this is a map of the all of the proposed sites for level one. So this includes the ICP forests and the lakes. So there's there's lots of detail in here. I won't go into this, but it just shows that we've got good geographic spread right across Ireland. Next slide. So for level two, this is, these are the sites where we're doing more, where there's more detailed atmospheric chemistry monitoring. So this is sort of continuous monitoring data, more or less. So it's a much smaller group of sites. Again, we're looking at the extremes of the gradient. So we want to be able to compare low end and high end sites. And perhaps, the next most important criterion was to have good spatial coverage across Ireland. And in terms of actually selecting sites, we need sites where we can work with site managers and owners and where they're willing these measurements to take place. And, and to some extent, they can sort of keep an eye on the kit, for example. So it's, you know, that's, a, that's one of the, the criteria for selecting the, the sites. Next slide. Um, there's two two levels to the two sub levels, I should say, to the sort of level two selection. So there's a core set of sites where all the main atmospheric chemistry monitoring happens and rainfall, so we can get really good data on the fluxes. So we have existing ICP uh, sites for waters and forests, um, and then proposed new sites for the habitats we're we're covering. Now these aren't balanced across the habitats because that's probably slightly less important than having good coverage across Ireland. As long as we've got you know, at least one site in each habitat, that's the main focus really. So you can see from the, the, the map, we've got again, reasonable coverage across Ireland. And next slide. So because ammonia is very spatially variable, uh, we've taken the, the, the sort of suggestion that the, uh, those fewer core level two sites probably don't provide enough detailed spatial coverage to capture that variation in ammonia. So there's, there's sort of extension sites for, for level two, which is specifically focusing on monitoring ammonia so it just gives them a better chance to get good spatial coverage of the ammonia variation across Ireland. So that's what the, the map here shows is these, these kind of extension sites to monitor ammonia. So solely ammonia, but these add into the data on the, the atmospheric chemistry. And I think that's the end of my presentation. So I will hand over to Ed Rowe, my colleague Ed Rowe, who will talk about the, the monitoring being done for uh, ecological impacts. Thanks, Lawrence. So Phil will switch to Ed now. And, yeah. um, Hello everyone, uh, I'm just trying to find my presentation. Um, 
hands up. Can people see that first slide? It says biodiversity and soil monitoring. It's perfect. Yeah, there. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, as Thomas was saying, this, it's fairly flexible which precise measurements are included in this network. So there, there are recommendations from IC for, ICP forests and ICP vegetation, um, but really there's quite a wide set of measurements that are recommended. Um, and so I guess the approach we've taken is to focus on things which have been shown to provide evidence of nitrogen impacts in the past. Um, so it, it's perhaps useful to think a little bit about the ecosystem impacts of air pollution. Um, so these happen through eutrophication by nitrogen pollution, um, by direct toxic effects uh, of some of these gases, through acidification, so nitrogen is an acidifying pollutant, whether it comes in as ammonia or as oxidized nitrogen, um, and by the accumulation of pollutants within systems. Um, I guess over the last few decades, it's become clear just how large an effect nitrogen eutrophication in particular by nitrogen has on ecosystems. Um, so there's been a lot of studies that have shown declines in species richness and other biodiversity indicators in relation to nitrogen pollution gradients. Um, and really a, a lot of what's happening here is that um, the kind of the fertilization of habitats by nitrogen favors the growth of more competitive or more light competitive species. So these are the kind of tall, thinly, fast growing things like brambles and nettles, typical examples. Um, and um, it's striking that the species that are most threatened and or that are already extinct tend to be the shorter ones. So it's it's short species that require a lot of light at ground level that are particularly affected by nitrogen pollution. And we have a lot of evidence for plants and for lichens, but that's probably also true for animals that need light at ground level. So things like um, you know invertebrates, butterflies and ants and things, and vertebrates and birds that depend on those. So this is the kind of picture. I mean, um, acidification is still a problem, but because sulfur pollution has been cleaned up so much, really, apart from shipping, um, then you know that's, I guess, not such a dominant issue anymore, apart from some very acid-sensitive places. Um, the direct toxic effects of, of ammonia and of ground-level ozone are really only just being um, evidenced at the moment. Um, and I guess for those reasons, we are we are focusing this network on nitrogen pollution and nitrogen pollution impacts. Um, as Lawrence was saying, a lot of these measurements, a lot of these things you can measure about the systems are rather slow to respond to ecosystem uh, to air pollution. So we don't need to monitor all that often, every four years would be okay. Um, and it, I guess this idea that we have permanent sites where we, we monitor over time is, is really useful. We tend to get more valuable data if we are getting measuring the same spot time after time. Um, so we're thinking of in terms of a set of sites, 15 sites per habitat. Um, some of these sites might have more than one habitat, which saves on site visiting costs. But for each one, we are recommending taking samples from five different points within the habitat. Now, here's a nice, easy example of a site where this, this would be easy. For some of our sites, the, the habitat is spread over a large area, and sometimes it's fragmented. So, um, it, you know, so so this will have to be adapted. And essentially, it's quite nice to have some sort of randomization, so you're not kind of subjectively picking a particular spot to monitor. You have to be pragmatic here. If you randomize over a huge site, it's going to take you days just to get around it. So, we're thinking in terms of, um, you know, saying that each plot needs to be within 20 minutes of another one, something like that. Um, yeah, as we've been saying, all, all of these things are proposals and suggestions. So, so part of the idea for this workshop is to get get some feedback on this. So you're welcome to comment. Um, okay, thinking about the the biogeochemical indicators uh, of air pollution. So these are things like you know, nitrogen concentration or um, solar pH. Um, I guess there's been quite a few things that have been proposed to be measured uh, and some of them are more useful than others and some of them are cheaper than others. So what we're focusing on is measurements that are um, have been shown to respond to nitrogen pollution and are fairly cheap. So um, for each of these sites we're going to get a, a bulk sample from the five points of soil from 0 to 15 centimeters um, and measure these simple things so soil pH and total organic C and N content. 
Um, one of the things that seems to respond quite consistently to nitrogen pollution is the tissue concentration of nitrogen in mosses. Um, so this is a focus of ICP vegetation monitoring. Um, a lot of that has been focused on uh, acid sensitive habitats. So there's kind of a bit of a gap for um, calcareous habitats and we recommend Pseudosclerodium purum as a moss that, that occurs across neutral and calcareous habitats. Um, so essentially this is, this is basically the ICP vegetation method with a few refinements. Okay, but we're not proposing many of the measurements that are in the ICP forests protocol, in particular soil solution measurements. That's because installing lysimeters is a bit tricky. They are temperamental things and they need some practical. Um, there's also a lot of focus on soil sampling using horizon-based methods and, and sampling different horizons, which involves digging a soil pit, and that is, again, time-consuming and more expensive. And there's other things which we think are maybe not the maybe not things to include in this first round of essential measurements. Okay, but a lot of what we're interested in really is effects on ecosystems and biodiversity. So people are not really so much interested in soil chemistry, they tend to be interested in does it have flowers and does it have these distinct species, or that kind of idea. So um, a key idea here is species richness, how many species do you have in a given area? Um, but that's not the whole story. So some of our habitats are, um, I guess, naturally or in a good condition, they wouldn't have all that many species, especially of vascular plants. I'm thinking of, of bulks and heats. Um, it can be very rich in other taxa, but vascular plants are maybe not so rich. And so we have this idea of um, that you have distinctive species or typical species, positive indicator species. Um, and that it, within ICP modeling and mapping, which is the main ICP I work within, that idea that you have, um, you know, really a subjective choice of species that you want in your habitat, you know, that's clear, rather than total species list, maybe a more sensitive indicator, or at least an indicator that matches what habitat specialists think of as being a good example of a bog or heat. Anyway, none of this really matters because if we get the data on all of the plant and lichen species that we have in an area, then we can derive any of these indicators. So we can derive species richness or positive indicator metrics simple things like forbed grass ratio, um, so how many of these things are going to flower, um, and also more subtle indicators of the environmental conditions. So each species has been rated for its kind of typical environment, and so we can say things like, what's the typical fertility score for the species here? What's the typical height of these species? Um, and there are ideas about, are they nitrophilic or nitrophobic? So, so this, this tells you really something quite directly about how nitrogen affected habitat is. So this is a key part of the assessment, and we strongly recommend um, doing floristic assessments that include all of the bryophyte and all of the lichen species. Um, yeah, we were thinking that maybe we would only recommend bryophytes and lichens for, for bogs and heaths, but it's clear that they're important for grasslands too. So yeah, that's a strong recommendation. Um, just to dwell on the theme of permanent plots a little, um, as I say, the floristic data is, has been the most valuable really for showing nitrogen impacts and air pollution impacts in general. Um, and the reason we emphasize permanent plots is because vegetation can change quite a lot. So, um, it, you know, if a grassland um, becomes unmanaged, it can revert to scrub, or, you know, if a heathland becomes uh, fertilized, then it can become grassland. There, there are lots of these transitions. Some of those are real, but, um, I hope I'm not going to offend anyone by saying this, but um, vegetation mapping is rather subjective. So here's a really nice study where um, eight experienced surveyors surveyed the same mountain and they came up with rather different maps of the vegetation. I mean, it's not quite as bad as it looks here, so the green and the blue are both mires, but some of these areas were mapped as a mire by one person and a grassland by another person. So if we have a method where a, a, someone visiting the site assigns where the quadrat, where the plot is going to be on the basis of their perception of the habitat map, inevitably you'll have some of these changes of perception or changes of, you know, that they'll say, well, this plot shouldn't be here because it's the wrong class. And actually, from a pollution impact point of view, we're really interested in some of these real changes. So if, if it does change from heathland to grassland, that is, that could be due to nitrogen pollution. So really we want to keep monitoring the same point. Uh, now I'm laboring this point a little because it's, it is more expensive. It's more time consuming to refine the plot. And to, to be able to do that, you need to put the time into 
making sure it can be refound. So the way we do this in the UK countryside survey, which is every seven to 10 years, is we knock in a wooden stake. We also knock in an aluminium plate underground. Um, so if you need to use a metal detector, you might be able to find it again that way. But the key thing for finding a plot, I, I found with doing this a lot, is a good local photo, a good plot location photo that has a fence post or a stone and a sketch map with some compass bearings. So that, that kind of stuff does take a bit of time, but it's very useful. Of course, sometimes plots are destroyed, so we'll need to have a, a, a way of adding in so we maintain 15 plots within that habitat. Um, so there's, there's a bit more to be done on the protocol here, but in principle, um, the plots are important. So this, I think this is the last slide. Um, so how do we monitor the fluistics? Um, well, a classic way is to mark out two by two meters and, and record all the species within it, and then to do some sort of visual estimate of cover. That's that's fine. That's you know that's a reasonable method. Um, I guess it doesn't might not work quite so well for coarse grained habitats. So things like bogs that have humps and hollows, um, or more mosaic-y things, uh, things like limestone pavement maybe. Um, for those habitats, if you want a full species list, really you need a bigger area, also for woodlands. Um, so the a standard method that we use for all habitats in the UK countryside survey is, is this kind of ring-based method where you search the center exhaustively first, and then you scan each ring to see if you're picking up new species. Um, again, this is more time consuming um, than a two by two meter, but um, in my experience, it's not that much more time consuming. Uh, okay, so, um, this is, we've been focusing on open habitats because that was the remit. We haven't thought so much about ICP forests and how that protocol might be adapted or refined to, to provide air pollution impacts evidence. Um, but I think a key part of that is that we're really, really interested in epiphytes. So I, I mean, epiphytic lichens and bryophytes. And those are really responsive. Um, they tend to be exposed directly to air pollution and that there isn't so much buffering in the, in the system uh, for the epiphytes. So that, those are really useful data. I mean, you have epiphytes and heaths and that sort of thing as well, but we should pick those up with the ground level quadrats. So I guess what we're recommending is for the ICP forest, for the forests monitoring, it would be useful to have good data on epiphytic lichens and bryophytes. Um, we've gone into this, all of this in more detail in, in the report. I think we'll have a draft to to circulate quite soon. So you can give feedback on that. But I suppose those are the ideas and um, you're welcome to feedback in questions. We'll discuss this in a minute. Um, but also, if you want to write me an email later, uh, we'll, we'll make sure your ideas get considered and uh, you know, we'll review the recommendations in the light of that. And then there will be a process of deciding actually how the survey is going to be designed and how it's going to work. But uh, this is the stage we're at now, we're proposing a design. Okay, that's to be done. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sim now, who's talking about um, monitoring air pollution chemistry, deposition and concentration. Great, thank you. So can everyone hear me? Can everyone see the slide? Yes and yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so my name is Sim Tang, I work at UKCH Edinburgh. So the uh, final talk of the day, we'll, I'll take you through a tiered approach that we're proposing for cost-efficient monitoring and reporting the concentrations and deposition of the air pollutants of interest under Article 9 of the NEC Directive, together with a brief overview of suitable air monitoring approaches and recommendations. So um, the impacts of concerns are acidification, eutrophication, and ozone damage to vegetation growth and biodiversity. In 2018, 5% of the total ecosystem area in Europe were in exceedance of the critical loads of acidification, and a much larger area, 65%, were in fact in exceedance of the critical acidification. The aims of the NEC directive is therefore to improve the condition of ecosystems across the EU in line with the biodiversity and ecosystem objectives under the Clean Air for Europe program and also the Seventh Environment Action Program. 
So the, there's a group of five key pollutants that are identified as contributing to acidification, eutrophication, ozone damage to sensitive habitats. So these are the sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, ammonia, non-methane, volatile organic carbons, which are precursor to ground level ozone formation, and also PM 2.5. Under the National Emission Ceilings Director, Ireland is committed to deliver emission reductions of these pollutants. And uh, the targets are shown in these graphs together with the long-term trends and projected emissions for each of the components. And um, monitoring and reporting the concentrations of the pollutants will provide us with the evidence to potentially assess change and recovery in ecosystem response following any reduction in their emissions following application of abatement measures. And ammonia is a very reactive gas with high deposition velocity. And the projected emission shows very little change in its emissions. And the target is also not very ambitious. So this suggests that uh, ammonia will increasingly be a major contributor to nitrogen pollution and be a major driver towards exceedance of critical loads of acidity and eutrophication. The reaction of ammonia with acid gases in the atmosphere forms fine ammonium aerosols that are a major component of PM 2.5. So PM 2.5 also contributes to nitrogen and sulfur deposition and are also implicated in harmful effects on human health. The gases and aerosols are removed from the atmosphere from in wet via the precipitation or via dry deposition processes. This is via direct uptake by vegetation and surfaces. Unlike the gases which deposit very locally to sources, the aerosols can be transported to much longer distances and contribute to pollution at regional to transboundary scales. So uh, with a substantial decline in sulfur emission and concentrations, we are expecting to see a much larger shift in the composition of the aerosols from ammonium sulfate to that of ammonium nitrate. This has implication for the chemical climate because ammonium nitrate is semi-volatile. So this will potentially extend the lifetime of ammonia and nitric acid because ammonium nitrate can reform the two gases under certain conditions, for example, under warm and dry conditions. So this can have the potential to uh, increase the footprint of ammonia and NOx emissions and concentrations. The air pollutants that are required for reporting in Article 9 reporting template are summarized in this slide. These include the gases, ammonia, NOx and SOx, and the wet deposited components, uh, which will allow assessment of the critical load levels exceedance. And uh, these are policy tools that are widely used to assess the risk of changed ecosystems resulting for, from air pollution impacts. Carbon flux is an optional indicator to improve understanding on carbon sequestration by ecosystem in response to atmospheric nitrogen inputs, which is also important for climate change mitigation. For ozone, then we need the data for assessing uh, potential damage to vegetation by the exceedance of flux-based critical levels, such as the pod. A three levels approach is we're proposing to, for cost efficient monitoring and reporting of the relevant air pollutants 
in concentrations and deposition. At level one, we'll use model data to cover the major pollution gradients in sulfur and nitrogen. Wrong way around, <laughs> sorry. So at level two, we're proposing monthly monitoring of ammonia to derive the site-specific ammonia concentrations and dry deposition via ammonia. And the level two core will introduce additional measurements of the other nitrogen species, which will allow us to quantify the nitrogen budget. So this will include components such as nitric acid, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and the sulfur aerosols and also introducing bimonthly wet deposition to give us a wet deposition input to allow us to uh, derive a total nitrogen budget for each site. And um, the monitoring under NEMEN will be complemented by data from existing networks. So we will use data and form synergies with existing networks, such as the National Ambient Air Quality Networks, the EMAP, the network of EMAP sites, the wet deposition measurements that are made currently under met Erin program, and also propose current and proposed future measurement work at planned under CHAGAS and ICOS for the carbon flux measurements. Some examples of models used to map concentration and deposition island are shown here. The EMAP for UK atmospheric chemistry transport model is based on the EMAP MSCW model. And uh, these can map hourly to annual average atmospheric concentrations, for example, ammonia, acid gases, PM2.5, and dry and wet deposition of reduced nitrogen, oxidized nitrogen, and sulfur pollutants. The model resolution ranges from 100 kilometers from one kilometer and is currently developed uh, into EMAP for IE, so uh, developed for application for, the, for Ireland, led by Dr. Massimo Vienna from UKCH. Other examples also include uh, model data from the EMAP, EMAP and also other uh, modeling work for example, modeling nitrogen deposition from Cathcart et al. at Trent University using a big leaf deposition model and using uh, the MERA data from Met Irene. To ensure comparity of the monitoring data across the EU, the Article 9 guidance recommends that um, member states, where possible, use protocols that are already implemented in national networks. This includes, for example, um, the monitoring that's undertaken under EU directives, under the Ambient Air Quality Directive, using EU reference methods, and air monitoring protocols as laid out under the ICP monitoring schemes, and also um, the EMAP manual for sampling and chemical analysis with full details of uh, protocols. But of course, um, member states can also have the flexibility to um, use methods that are established in the individual countries. But um, in that case, we then provide full details on the protocol and provide indication of how it compares with the other protocols under ICP, EMAP, and for example, WMO Gore. The next two slides will just be a fair brief overview of um, air chemistry and precipitation protocols. So for the air chemistry measurements, we're recommending low time resolution methods and where possible to use passive methods and active methods with low power requirement because these require less infrastructure and less resources and will be 
cheaper to implement, which means that we can uh, potentially have a large number of sites providing these measurements. So, for example, for uh, monitoring ammonia and nitrogen dioxide, then uh, we're recommending um, methods that are already widely used in the UK and elsewhere. For example, the passive alpha sampler, which has a detection limit of about 0.03 micrograms per cubic meter of air, and the nitrogen dioxide diffusion tubes with a detection limit of about one and a half micrograms per cubic meter of air. So these can be deployed at large number of sites and uh, just requires monthly visits to exchange the samples. And um, so it's um, getting a setting up a network of uh, local site operators that can exchange the samples on monthly frequency and send them back to a central laboratory for processing. So um, these passive samplers are very useful, but um, they can only provide single species. And uh, so at uh, level two core site, we're then recommending the use of uh, an active denuder and filter pack method that can provide speciated measurements of gases and aerosols. So uh, for example, the uh, Delta denuder filter pack method, which has the low power requirement, so which means that uh, at remote sites, we can potentially deploy a wind and solar power system to give you the full speciation of the gas and aerosol components to derive dry deposition fluxes of nitrogen and sulfur. And then next slide, for our wet deposition measurements, then the bulk precipitation are already undertaken at uh, EMAP, at a met ear and site, and we're proposing to adopt the same protocol using a NILU design bulk collector at additional sites in the NEMA network. However, we are recommending two weekly or bi-monthly collections because monthly collections, we need to add a chemical preservative to prevent microbial degradation. If you don't add the preservatives, then there's potential loss of labile nitrogen. We are aware that um, having a two weekly or bi monthly collection increases the cost of such sampling because of the uh, increased frequency in site visits. But it's important to uh, preserve the robustness of the data because uh, doing monthly, you will lose the nitrogen species and uh, potential compromise in data quality. So in summary, we're recommending a, a tiered three level approach to provide cost efficient monitoring of air pollution impacts of the relevant pollutants that contribute to acidification, eutrophication, and ground level ozone. At level one, we will use <clears throat> model data complemented by data from existing networks to give us a full picture to allow us to uh, link air quality impacts to ecosystem effects. At level two, we are proposing to implement ammonia measurements at all sites in recognition of the spatial variability of ammonia and the fact that uh, it's a major driver of nitrogen pollution, of local nitrogen deposition and effects. And at level two core, we would then increase the number of components that we measure to uh, gas and aerosol components to allow us to derive the full nitrogen budget for the site, including our wet deposition measurements to allow us to get the total nitrogen. And uh, together with recommendation for suitable air and precipitation chemistry methods that uh, meet the criteria, <clears throat> that meet the criteria under the ICP EMAP WMO GORE protocols. Thank you very much for your attention. So, um, this ends the final talk, and I will now hand over to Ian, who will open the question and answer session. Thank you very much.
Great, Sim, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, and I'll just go, I, we do have some questions here, so I'll ask the rest of the um, speakers to switch on their uh, cameras as well, and we can deal with questions. So, um, let me see, do I want to share my screen? Uh, I don't think I need to share my screen at the moment, so um, we'll just go through the questions as we have them. But just to all reiterate again for anybody in the audience, if you do want to speak, just let us know and we can give you uh, permission. So it's just that just through this current platform, we need to do it in that way. So just put a comment into the question section and we can um, we can then give you the, the floor at that stage. So if you have any questions, you can either type them in, which some people have done already or... So um, having said that, thanks to all the speakers and I will go through a few questions that we have at the moment and some others may come along as we go through it. So the first question um, came, well, there was a question around the presentations and whether they'll be made available. Yeah, we can we can do that. I don't think there'll be a problem with that. So, and also as, as Dahi mentioned, the, the actual recording itself will be made available. So sorry, I forgot to mention that. So thanks for catching that one, Dahi. Um, the first, then there's a question here from Fiona Grant. Uh, how does this work? Um, link to ELTER in Ireland, and that's the long-term ecosystem research uh, infrastructure. So, yeah, I mean, that there's ongoing discussions in relation to that. Um, through the EPA research program, the EPA funded um, uh, the development or WIT to develop a business case for engagement in ELTER, and that's that uh, business case and that piece of research work has been completed now. So, um, and there's been some ongoing discussions within the sort of stakeholder group about how this could be progressed, even as uh, up until yesterday we had a meeting on this. So, nothing as concrete has been developed there at the moment, but um, I believe that uh, Owen Nocton and WIT are looking at um, options in terms of pushing that on and, and looking again, doing some additional work to look at the, the feasibility of developing a more formal ELTER um uh, structure in in Ireland so that's about as much as I can say on that at the moment unless um I know Owen is in the audience if he wants to comment he's welcome to but um I'll leave it there for on that one um and I suppose on a related question uh Bruce Osborne made the point that it would seem that given the proposed and ongoing monitoring networks that some national body is required to oversee everything and to ensure that there's no duplication of effort and to get the best, best value out of any work. Yeah, I mean, I think that's vital, that uh, the resources are limited. We we should avoid any duplication and we should look for as many synergies as possible. You know, ELTER is one option in terms of, of I suppose, bringing in that some level of, of oversight, but, um, you know, at the moment, there's there's nobody putting their hand up, so to speak, I suppose, in, in relation to, I suppose, coordinating everything across these different activities, whether it's, what may happen in the next couple of years in relation to ICOS or, or this network or the, the Chagas network that, um, that Thomas mentioned. So I don't know if any of the other uh, speakers want to come in on this, Thomas or Dahi. Dahi, maybe you can say something about with Chagas just on the ammonia monitoring. Um, yeah, no, and it's, well, in Tiger specifically, uh, I think Isaac McDara is um, on the call too. He's welcome to talk. Um, I know he's organising it. But it's a case that where they're carrying out um, ammonia um, monitoring or proposed ammonia monitoring um, that because it's, even though, as Ian said, or I think it was someone said earlier, that it's not on habitats of interest for our network because it's being carried out, it adds, it increases the resolution of ammonia monitoring for the proposed network, which will increase the any validation of the models that Sim was talking about. So it's all about increasing the points at which you can um, validate the any models that are created, which will increase the, the accuracy of the models and the application of those models onto the level one network then will be important too. Okay, thanks Dahi. Um, somebody's asked later on, is there a way that um, they can see the questions that other people are asking? Uh, unfortunately, there's not uh, on this platform. So it's a it's a slight issue, but we will read out the questions as we as we go through it. Um, 
So uh, there's a, a comment here from uh, from Nettie Van Dijk, um, ostensibly for Dahi, um, collecting more sampling. Uh, sorry, am I reading the question right? Um, collecting moss sampling, what are you going to measure in terms of species? So maybe we haven't thought about that yet. But. Well, we actually did, and I, I answered her se separately, but I, I thought everybody could see the questions and answers, but apparently that's not the case. No. Um, okay, so what I, what I said was kind of leaning back to Ed on this one because, and again, the cost effect effectiveness too, if we're proposing people go out to do, if we were, were to propose people go out and do surveys for mosses, you, you need a biologist to do that type of survey to identify the species level. But if you're only proposing you collect one or two moss species to analyze for nitrogen tissue, then it becomes much more feasible for anybody to go out to a site with a chart, say, okay, these are two species I get, I, they collect them and post them off for nitrogen analysis. So I think that's by far the easiest way to integrate um, that type of monitoring into this network, especially for any non-experts that were expecting to go out to sites and collect, and collect samples. So I'm not proposing, for, at least for ICP forests and freshwaters and maybe even not for national parks um, sites, that perhaps in, in this instance, the, um, the unless it's been carried out by the surveyors, i.e. for national parks during their surveys, and they're competent and well able to identify moss species levels, I see that's, that as a primary way for species to be identified. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't propose it be applied to any of the other sites, such as the ICP forest or ICP freshwaters. I think in, the, in that case, it's much more practical to identify, collect the species, spend the offer analysis. I think that's the way to go um, on that one. So it's, it's, it's I'll be, rather than doing species, you're looking at the percent nitrogen into tissues. Okay, thanks, Ahi. Yeah, another comment or question from Netty. Um... Just, I suppose, a comment, take note that existing vegetation monitoring networks are not designed for nitrogen impact. So they bulk, for instance, uh, nitrogen sensitive and less nitrogen sensitive species, um, or they're not looking at the most sensitive species. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this. Ed, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I think that, I mean, this is why we're recommending looking at all species. So we do an exhaustive search for the species. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is particularly relevant for, for the epiphytes. So epiphytic biophytes and lichens, it, you know, there we have quite a good idea of what's nitrogen sensitive and what's mm -hmm. nitrogen loving. So, um, yeah, there's definitely, well, but as, as I say, any of these indicators, so nitrophile, nitrophobe, forb, grass, Allenberg N, biodiversity indicators, if we have the full species list, we can derive all of them. Now, can, can I just say a little about the, you know, the use of the synergies and other networks? Um, yes. I think it doesn't matter a lot, really, if we move some of our sites. So, you know, if we say that we want 15 sites, but there's some sites which are, have good long-term data, we, you know, let's, let's move them. That makes sense. But where I wouldn't like to compromise is using a, um, a mixture of different methods. So, you know, if we have one heuristic monitoring method, which is based on scoring presence absence within cells, so that's you know another approach. It's quite difficult to mix up those data with the cover estimates and the exhaustive search data. So um, it does pay a lot to try to get some standard methods in across the whole network. Okay, that's great. Thanks for that, Ed. Um, question from Michael Young. Um, in proposing the potential sites, was consideration given to potential or actual locations of similar sites in Northern Ireland to optimise synergies and geographic coverage? I think the short answer is yes, um, but I don't know if you want to add anything on that, Dahi. Um, I can. Can you can actually just a question to the organisers? Can you see the answers that I submitted to the questions? Or um, no? That's, okay, I answered I answer that one as well. Um, simply uh. because, um, yeah. Slightly longer answer than Ian's, not too much longer, a yes, but um, <laughs> two of the actual proposed level two sites we have in our network are um, sites which are involved in the CAN project, which has lots of m multiple funders, including um, funders in Northern Ireland and um, the Republic of Ireland. So it's got fundamental from National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, NIA, Ulster Wildlife are involved. And what they're doing is they're, they're monitoring ammonia on um, sites that cross the borders. Um, they're doing lots of other things as well, but for our for today, that's the most important thing from our perspective. So they've got they've currently monitoring on Sleeve Bay and um, I can't remember the name of the second one it begins with C. It's over on the far side. Kulka. Kulka. S A C. 
yeah, both mm-hmm. upland sites. Um, so what we're proposing is we they're currently doing ammonia concentration monitoring is that we integrate those sites into our network. Now, it's, it, it's a short term project, so they won't be monitoring forever. So it's about developing the monitoring that they're doing now into long term sites. OK, thanks. So that's the yes, then. Um, next one is there this is for sim is there a modeling approach that can address the likely biological degradation of labile nitrogen um i won't go through the whole thing but um so for example um you could do fortnightly collection for a set period on on, on validation periods uh, but reduce the frequency once site specific conditions and results are identified any comments on that sim all right yeah no Okay, yeah, no, I think there's been ex- extensive work done already on bulk precipitation collection. And the s- consensus of the scientific community is that um, the safest is up to a maximum of two weekly collection, because beyond that, um, then you require micro uh, pre- preservation of the sample to stop loss of the nitrogen species. So it's, uh, it's a fair high risk. Mm. But um, also, if you want to use preservatives, then for some of these sensitive habitats, then it's a um, potential hazard to the environment. So, um, so one, use of preservative is uh, frowned upon. And two, for the sake of saving costs, which will compromise the quality of your data, then we really need to stick to two weekly collection. So if you want to, reduce the cost of chemical analysis potentially then you can combine the samples yeah. for a monthly analysis but i think i suspect the major cost is actually getting someone out there to exchange your sample bottles rather the actual lab analysis cost but um so i think with rain collection just because there's so many components in there so it's very nutrient rich and um, you got bugs, you got algae. So anything beyond two weeks, then it just compromises the data quality. So uh, it's a definite no, no. OK, so and you, you have you haven't come across this idea of, of modeling or, you know, doing. No. no. OK, OK, that's good. Uh, thanks, Sim. Um, you, can try, you can try and correct for the degradation, but um, it's uh, it adds uncertainty to your values. Okay. okay. Can I can I just briefly come in on that? Yes, of course. Yeah. So one of the things that has been used is uh, a biocide called thymol. Yeah, thymol. Uh, yeah. But if if you use that, that then adds a an organic nitrogen component. So you'd need two, you need duplicate collectors. If you did go down that route, so one to measure the total nitrogen, and then the one with thymol, which would keep the, the kind of you know prevent some of that mineralization and nitrogen processing that happens in internally in the sample. Okay, thanks, thanks, Lawrence. Yeah. Um, Sam, sorry, I'm just going to say uh, we, we carried out some monthly collection in a European network over a period of two years. And, uh, and we did use thymol as a biocide, but we were still getting loss of nitrogen. So in some cases, down to like zero. So uh, depending on the climate and where the site's located and how the, the site operator changes the samples, then um, yeah, we still lost those, those components. And it's hard to correct for it by, yeah reference to the other components okay that's it that's me okay thanks sim um another question just i think for possibly for you sim i'm not sure if you can see this one but it's i'll read it out for the audience it says um though passive time averaged are very useful for annual averaging and long-term effects it would be really good to have aligned a couple of high resolution measurement sites this brings synergies with NEC, necd submissions and understanding source attribution through the seasons and identifies drivers of change. Could this be incorporated? These super sites mm-hmm. act as uh, innovation platforms. Uh, and it's yeah. a matter of money, isn't it? You know, this is. This I think is... so, yeah. 
So uh, as uh, Ed and uh, Lawrence have pointed out earlier, ecosystem has low response. So um, the, <clears throat> the low time resolution measurements give us the um, long time trends and concentrations. But of course, it's be very useful to have the high resolution measurements for the kind of detail process understanding. Um, so in the EMAP monitoring strategy, they have a super site so um, to have detailed understanding. So uh, I guess uh, given av available resources, we can look at to understand the kind of carbon nitrogen interaction, for example, and um, yeah, the, the changes in the processes. But um, for the Article 9 network, because we're looking at long-term air quality impacts, then the monitoring on a monthly frequency will give us the information on potential long-term changes. Okay. Okay, thanks, Sim. I mean, I, I do just, like... just briefly to, to add ahead. to that, the, the high temporal mm -hmm. resolution monitoring also gives you a more accurate flux at an annual level. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you need them, yeah, with a detailed meteorological input. To kind of, but um, that would be very site specific though for that specific site, although it will inform the model development. So um, yeah, so uh, high temporal resolution measurements can potentially help you develop your model and improve the parameterization. Okay, uh, thanks, Sam. I mean, I I do like the idea of of um, these super sites, but I think. I think we we sort of set our ambition level for the moment at sort of reasonably good sites, and then we'll, you know, the the super sites may be sort of more of a long term long term aspiration. So it's not something we're we're ruling out at the moment. Um, so just going on another question from Susan uh, Zapala. I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing your name okay. Um, what recommendations were put forward in terms of data collation across Ireland, but also for addressing transboundary monitoring? So who would like to think about that one? Dahi. <laughs> the tough ones. We've got a little section on the data management, haven't we? Yeah, no, because as Ed, we, we've been in touch with the NIEA and Ultra Wildlife about monitoring they've been doing on their sites. But um, I, I guess theoretically there is there is a potential issue of transboundary pollution and trans and impacts as a result of that said transboundary. Um, contribution to emissions and subsequently impacts because we do have neighbours to the north who are downwind of us and um, so theoretically the ammo ammonia nitrogen that we're, we're that we produce um proximal to northern ireland can can transfer um i i guess it's just a case of um we need to keep lines of communication open with our, our partners in northern ireland and make sure that there is some level of um synergy between their networks and our network um because um, I'm correct in saying that Northern Ireland, as part of the UK, even though Brexit is a pending and they will be leaving the European Union, um, they will be maintaining their, their monitoring as required under the National Mission Seasons Directive. Am I right in saying that, Sim? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, we've got the 25 year environment plan, so it's aligned. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I guess then it'll be a case but, of. Uh, um, Sorry, Sim, can you? So I guess the question was about <clears throat> the data collection, isn't it? Potential mm. sharing of that data. So at the moment, um, all the emissions data available from EMAP and um, air quality data in, in Ireland is uh, available via the EPA website, for example, the Ambient Air Quality Director. So in the review report, um, we have covered the kind of uh, data management and data collection and uh, it would be useful, helpful at some stage to have a website dedicated to the network. So uh, that provides information on the network sites and links to other networks. And, um, and it uh, provides uh, a location where people can potentially access that data and use that data and share that data. So, but that's something that's kind of in discussion and recommendation in the uh, review report but uh, it would be very helpful to have all the data in one place that's accessible and uh, draw in 
connection with other networks. Yeah, and probably just to build on that, I mean, we're really still in the very much the design phase of the actual network itself. On the to-do list is the design of how the data is stored and managed over over long periods of time. Because once we start collecting the data um, from the network, it's going to be very important that it's organized and stored adequately and accessibly, because we want it to be accessible to the um, to general public too and scientific communities as required. So. Um, yeah, I think it, it's probably early days yet, but it's definitely on the agenda. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks both for that. Um, just to move on, just another point from Bruce in relation to data sharing that individual networks involved in carbon sequestration, for instance, would benefit from information on air pollutants and nitrogen deposition. Yep. Obviously, so to make the data freely available, we'll be reporting all of this data to the EU anyway. Um, on a on a periodic basis, so it would make sense to, that this would be available as part of uh, the broader work going on. And even more, and even more precise than that, I mean, we've been in touch with um, Matt Saunders in Trinity, who seems to be leading a lot of the um, carbon um, monitoring. So we've we've been in direct contact with the the, pro the proposed ICOS network, and we're proposing links with that monitoring network too. So rather than just having the the um, data available will be direct, hopefully, um, directly involved with um, both both networks having um, co-located sites. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dahi. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Sam. Did you want to come in? Oh, sorry. No, no. I was just <laughs> sorry. I'm just reading it out aloud to myself. Questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, we got the next. Forget. Yeah, we have a question from my colleague Lisa Shields of the EPA. So, just in relation to again this idea of non-duplication of effort, she asks: Has a full mapping exercise been undertaken? Of what data and tools are available already in Ireland, and I guess what monitoring is ongoing? Uh, not just monitoring by agencies, but research projects. Yeah, I mean, I, I can come in on that, but I, yeah, I mean that was part of this study, obviously, to look at what's out there because there's no point in trying to reinvent the wheel if, if and where we can build on synergies. But I think. That's something that we need to continue to do because there's a lot of activity in this area, and this is also something that has been discussed in in relation to that sort of LTER uh, structure, and obviously that would bring about that level of consistency and oversight about what's going on, who's doing what, um, etc. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's a good point. If anybody else wants to comment on that, I can come in a little bit. Um, but yeah, one one thing we did um, relatively towards the end of the project, but I got in touch with a lot of um, Academics that may be doing monitoring or may have had sites that they've done monitoring historically on, and a lot of the sites that were suggested from were actually sites we we already in our network to be included for consideration of inclusion. So we we're actually by coincidence we we're actually do we're actually co-locating with with past monitoring projects because they're kind of some of them were relatively famous sites, you know, the Burren and Clarny National Park. So these are areas which would be um, targets for academic research. Um, but also, as a result of that, that kind of led us onto the CAN project as well, from which we've identified two sites um, on the border of Northern Ireland for inclusion in our network. So it was, it was more of an informal approach rather than compiling a full database of all monitoring. Um, and a lot of it was emailing somebody and then they get, send me on to somebody else um, type of thing. So a lot more through word of mouth and emails and contact that we pull together an informal list and use it where relevant to inform our site selection. It's worth bearing in mind also the criteria for monitoring that this needs to be um, sort of repeated. So there needs to be a long term commitment to this. So individual research projects can add a lot of detail about one site, but the, the requirement for long term data collection on a regular cycle using the same methodology is also part of the, the consideration on what, what can be included and what can't. Okay, that's good. Thanks, thanks, Lawrence. Um, I'll just move on to then a question from Luke Heffernan, who uh, asks about the organisation who will run the ICP Forest Level Two monitoring sites and where is it envisaged, envisaged the funding will come from? Yeah, good question, uh, Luke. I mean, I, and I know we've spoken about uh, your work on this before. I think um, what we have in the report here is what ideally would like to be developed as a national ecosystems monitoring network. 
the, the, the detail in terms of who will do what or when, um, you know, this, this needs to be teased out and we need to look at resources and funding. So none of this has been, uh, none of this has been gone into in, in, in that level of detail at this stage. Um, but it's something that we'll have to sort of, we'll, you know, the, the network, the idea is the network will be developed in an through an iterative process. So we're not suddenly going to have these 60, 70 additional um, terrestrial sites um, straight away, you know. So I think we'll have to look at how the ICP forest level two sits in the overall structure and how and when that could be brought in, who could do it, how much is it going to cost, etc. So that's um, that's still still up in the air, and it's obviously something that we need to talk to to you uh, about. So, and I don't know if Thomas or or Dahi want to come in on that. Yeah, I just to emphasize that there's no current funding for ICP two level level uh, level two forest monitoring. There is a long history of monitoring back to the early nineties, and there's a very large network uh, across Europe of sites, but but there's no current for the the last monitoring was in mid twenty seventeen. Um, so really, I think realistically, the only hope for funding for those two sites, as they are, or, or more if they were added, is through this mechanism. That that uh, and that's the case in several countries. Quite a few countries uh, are unable to nationally fund their ICP two level forest sites, even if they previously were. And this is this is seen as as an opportunity to justify national funding for those sites. Okay, uh, thanks, Thomas. I'll move on. We have another few questions to get through, so I'll move on. Another question from Susan Zapala. Um, for you, Ed, it's possibly if there's a capability issue you might uh, you rightly raise about bryophyte and lower plant identification for assisting with monitoring impacts of nitrogen. Any plans for addressing this? If so, UK interagency group may be interested in joining up. So I, I don't know if you want to expand on that, Ed, or any comments in, in response to that. We did discuss this at a certain point, but I can't quite remember where we got to. Um, I think uh, Deirdre Lynn had the impression that there was the capability um, that, you know, it, it takes a bit more finding those people and we might have to pay them more. Um, I know that there's been a lot of capacity building. Um, I don't know, University of Edinburgh do a, do a whole, have a whole speciality on Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi ID. So I think there are people out there um, Let's, let's hope that we can find it. <laughs> well, otherwise we're in trouble. Yeah. So, um, yeah. okay, but uh, that's a, it's a significant point that we need to to address. Obviously, um, another comment here in relation to your so you stress the the importance of uh, consistent methodologies, uh, Ed and Lisa Shields. Just again asked what are the what are other similar countries doing in this space in relation to bogs. Scotland, Norway, Sweden, for example. I, I, yeah, I don't know if you have anything, any experience from other jurisdictions around their approach. I could talk about the UK. That's the main one I know. Um, so uh, yeah, in the UK we have various networks that have been going for various amounts of time. Some of them have relatively few sites that are intensively monitored. Some are more survey approaches. Um, since the evolution, we have different approaches in Wales and England and Scotland uh, for some things. Um, and, you know, for, for all of these habitats, I, I think there's always a tension between habitat specialists who are aware of the idiosyncrasies and nuances of their particular habitat and develop particular methods for monitoring that, and generalists that want, you know, want similar methods across the whole, the whole set of habitats. So in the UK, we have a whole, you know, whole debate about how to monitor bogs, as, as I'm sure you do in, in the Republic, and, and um, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, this is only a proposal, and I, I think it, the, the merit of having the same method applied across all habitats is, you know, that's a compromise. And, uh, you know, if the thinking is that we, we need to have, um, you know, um, bog monitoring both based on the area of sign you see and, you know, different monitoring for, for humps and hollows, yeah, well, let's, let's, let's think about that, you know. Um, Okay. I'm not sure. I, I, thought was, I, I use a lot of large-scale data sets, so for me, consistent methodology is, is worth a lot. Okay. I, I might draw attention again to the, the explicit mention in the NEC directive 
of the ICPs and their methods. ICP forests is the one I'd be more uh, most familiar with, and there are very well developed and and consistently applied methods with intercalibrations, and uh, and a community of uh, expert panels who have formal meetings under those auspices. Um, there, I, I find it hard to see an emerging uh, uh, NEC ecosystems community. There must there must be because this process is happening in multiple countries and there's a clear need for people doing the same work to, to join up. Um, and there, there has been some mention of developing expert groups or, or common interest panels within this context across the countries. Um, I would say there's a risk of doing that, that it may duplicate work that's under ICP forests, but there's always the, also the, the limitation of the ICP forests. Um, uh, expert panels that they don't cover enough. They don't cover enough habitats, especially like the botanical uh, focus isn't isn't there. So there there are some existing uh, uh, collaborations, and it, it'll be you know uh, I think it's important we look out for them and and, and foster them. This is obviously needs international collaboration that we we don't have or we're not we're not creating at this point. So it doesn't currently exist. It should exist. Uh, we do need to get there. Okay, thanks, Thomas. Um, question in from Brian uh, Donlan in relation to how much this is all going to cost. Um, is, is there a plan B? Well, there's, there's not even a plan A yet. Um, that's what we're sort of working <laughs> on at the moment, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of issues to overcome, Brian, before we can sort of put a cost on this. I mean, obviously, the the plan B, I suppose, as as is outlined in the report at the moment, is that we would reduce the number of ha habitats, and so still. The recommendation is to keep 15 sites per habitat but have less habitats and that's where this sort of iterative approach could come in um, and just to add also pointed out to me in the message there just to highlight that we have obviously we have these level one sites where there's no uh, instrumental monitoring we have the level two sites which have a higher level which have a level of instrumentation but they're they're nested it's a sort of a nested grid in that the level two sites will also undergo the level one monitoring um, so all of these elements that need to be taken into account, and obviously we also have the benefit that, in relation to the the the, the lakes, for example, that you know obviously the EPA are already doing work under the Water Framework Directive on that, and that um, you know the the level one forestry monitoring is already being carried out by our, our forestry uh, colleagues. So again, you know we have a, a start in some of those areas, and the, the, the terrestrial habitats are the ones that really need to be developed significantly and there's a lot of a lot of logistical issues around you know access to sites and carrying out appropriate assessments where we're going to be putting instrumentation on um, on you know SACs for example so there's a there's a lot of logistical issues that will come before we can sort of get to the stage where we have a, a full cost on what's what this what what this is going to result in both in terms of the initial setup and then the ongoing um, the ongoing operation because obviously for example, if we have monitoring equipment in Killarney National Park, uh, we're going to need we're going to we'll need somebody relatively localish to to go and collect those kind of things. So there's all these elements to think about in terms of how we can maintain costs on a reasonable level. So the short answer is not yet. Uh, if anybody else wants to come in, otherwise I'll move on. Um, let me see. So another question from Susan. Uh, JNCC could help with keeping lines about data sharing open. We are quite interested in including Ireland in future data collation or access projects on air pollution and ecosystems. Great. Thanks uh, for that, Susan. We shall we shall come back to you on that. But that sounds like a great offer. So we appreciate that. Um, anybody else wants to comment on that? Or? Nope. Sounds great. Happy for the help, uh, Susan. Okay. Appreciate yeah, it as yeah. always. You'll be sorry you offered, <laughs> but uh, we'll take you up on that. Okay. Um, and then um, we're can just, I just back to, sorry. Can I just get back to Susan on the um, private identification for monitoring yes. impacts? Uh, just to say that Felicity Hayes at uh, CH Bangor, she's uh, coordinating a moss collection for heavy metals, nitrogen, and microplastics in a new year. And so uh, she's chair of the ICP Vegetation, and uh, she's putting together a simple protocol for people to collect mosses 
of certain species for the monitoring. So I guess um, this is where we can potentially have some collaboration on developing simple guides. So um, there's already a guide developed for lichen ID, for example, for uh, looking at uh, the lichen margin app. So something like that, but uh, we would just uh, keep uh, communicating. I think we would talk to each other and okay. collaborate. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so we're just about drawing to a close. So just one more, uh, I suppose, comment or question from Mark White in, in WIT, who obviously has been in doing some of the work on on Elter and this business case that I mentioned already in relation to Elter and how this discussion today might sort of help in, in joining the dots between the, the in terms of developing a national Elter structure. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's some interesting output from today in terms of the questions around sort of the overall coordination and developing synergies, et cetera, that we need to, to think about. So I think it could be, uh, it's further information to add into the into the discussions on that, Mark. Um, so uh, that's all I had to say. I'm not anybody else has any comments in relation to Elter at this stage. No. Okay. It is now 10 minutes to 12. And we said we would uh, wrap things up around then. So if anybody has any last minute questions, we've gone through all the questions at this stage. But if anybody has any last minute questions, then pop them in. Otherwise, I'll just sort of wrap up. And I suppose, just first of all, the thanks, thank everybody, thank the speakers for their presentations and thank UCD and CEH for the, the work that they put in to this. We're, we're, we're nearly there. Um, and as I said already, really, this is sort of the, step one and then there's a lot of work to do on this in terms of it'll be interesting to look back in five six years time and see how closely what we have resembles what uh, what is written in this uh, in the report or what we've presented to you today so hopefully there's a there's a reasonable uh, resemblance between between the two and we've made some some positive progress in that regard there's a lot of work to do obviously following on from that and we're we are more than happy to engage and uh, discuss uh, any of this with any of the stakeholders that are on the call today or or who aren't involved and there were some people who couldn't make it as well we're also happy to share the um share the report and the the slides from today so the report i guess oh, it's it's uh, not quite finished yet but it's 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 getting there so i won't yeah i won't hold Dahi to to ransom over this but you know, I, I, we're talking weeks, um, I suppose, or days, possibly, depending, <laughs> depending on on the, the, on the uh, his time frame. But yeah, we're we're very close. So I think yeah. you know, it, it, the more input we can get into this process, the better, um, and the more engagement we can have with all of the stakeholders in terms of the potential to develop synergy. So it's really something that I'd like to to um, encourage and also just as I mentioned that we will set up a we will look to set up a national steering group with relevant stakeholders to uh, guide the work that we have here um, from an EPA point of view obviously we're we're hoping we don't have any staff to actually do this at the moment so we're hoping that we will um, get some staff next year all going well um, and that we'll be able to start actually progressing some of the groundwork to to get some of this monitoring in place and we'll also be discussing with mpws how we could um work with them in terms of of the work that they're doing on on bogs etc next year so i think yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of loose ends to tie up but i think we've we've made good progress over the course of this um report i think it's a really it's a really good output um so uh, you my email um address was on the slide earlier but i can uh, i can i'm happy to take any questions or comments from anybody or anything any input that you may have into the report before we finalize it um so that was about it please keep the communication lines open and we were happy we we're happy to get anything um that you may have to give any final words from any of the the speakers today before we finish up just as thank you again Ian, um, and just to highlight to anyone that attended and uh, my email is always open i believe i've already you already sh should have on my email address i sent you out the invite for the webinar today 
But again, if you have any questions about the network at any point, send me an email, send me any one too, um, and I can I can make sure it's communicated to the rest of the group as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So again, thanks, thanks everybody else. We appreciate your time, and hopefully we'll actually be able to meet face to face with all of the stakeholders and and get some of our UK CEH colleagues over. Uh, our pint of Guinness. Next year. Yeah, <laughs> when things are when things are, are back to normal. So in the meantime, you'll be hearing you'll all be hearing from us again in the near future. I think we have your contact details, and we'll be sharing slides and whatever else with you and um, the report and. Uh, so have a have a good afternoon. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for attending. <laughs> Thanks guys.